Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Tap Calf Transmissions. I am Corey, joined as always by Justin. Mr. Eckhart's Ladder, how are you doing tonight? Doing quite well. Doing quite well. Like I've just been lassoed by a sexy Yuzhan Vong Shi warrior. How about yourself? Uh, I'm good. I haven't fought any Yuzhan Vong warriors or otherwise, so I don't know why that would improve your night. Like, are you really well, that into it? They'd be after the war. Do you think there was like some... BDSM king lounges that they use on Vong opened. Is that where this went? I mean, yeah, for sure. They were definitely like, yeah, they were, they were trying to share with the infidels in a less kind of fully destructive way, I think. Hmm. Okay. I can. Nice. I think we can all get behind that. Yeah. But or tonight. Up in that or. Yeah. Penetra penetrated. Flipped upside down by that, tied up by that, whatever. Whatever you're into. Yep. But tonight, we are talking about Balance Point by Kathy Tires. Tears, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is our... This is this is special, because our first episode, who was that book by? Yeah. And have we done any others? No, she's only written the two full novels. She did some other short stories, I think. She doesn't come back and do the, the other... Um, no, that's by... I know you'd think, like, oh, that's about the Sea Ruby. You, you know yeah. it would make sense to write those? But no, yeah. they, she doesn't get to write those. Instead, yeah. that's uh, okay. Walter Sean Williams and... Oh. Other... Sean William Scott? Cool. Orson Scott Card and Sergeant Johnson. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. He was one of the, the, the most famous Star Wars authors. Yeah. I don't know what the lady's like. 19 book arcs. I, yeah, I, the Orson Scott card thing, I just, I, I loved the, uh, the Mormon arc that Luke had. Halfway through, uh... <laughs> well, Luke has a bit of an arc in, uh, in this book. A little, a little life event that I guess our, my title spoiled a bit. But before we get into Balance Point, uh, which I think you said was your favorite NJO book so far. Ugh. Uh, Ugh. Any any Star Wars news that we want to talk about? There, there was obviously the Andor delay. So rather than mm -hmm. starting, I think it was supposed to be August 30th. It is now September 21st or August 31st, whichever. It doesn't 31st, matter anyway. Yeah. It's not happening anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it's three week delay on the series starting. But there's also three episodes coming out at once now. So I think that still puts it like a week behind overall. But uh yeah, which, yeah, it's so, I'm not looking, I mean, I'm obviously looking forward to the show. Three episodes coming out at once, that's a lot. Um, yeah. I like to have it spaced out personally. Um, that's like my favorite thing that Disney Plus does compared to like a Netflix. So it sucks that, you know, we're getting so much one week. I don't really mind the delay though. It is what it is. I was yeah. kind of, for work purposes, hoping it would not get delayed, but it's not a big deal. Yeah, the the only thing for me is that like this means, especially with Bad Batch starting a few weeks in, there's mm. going to be a a week with three episodes, then maybe a couple weeks with one episode, then we have Bad Batch plus Andor going on for however many weeks after that. So that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be all be hands on deck, really. Once September yeah. comes, it's like pretty much that's when things are really getting heated and then... They're not going to slow down much. I mean, because we've got uh, before long, it'll be Ahsoka and Mando season three. And we've got Star Wars Visions coming uh, whenever that comes. Book of uh, Boba Fett season Book two, Mandalor or Kenobi season two. I think two. it's coming. I do think Book of Boba Fett. Season yeah, that's probably not until like 2024 for either of those if they happen, though. Yeah. And don't forget, Andor season two is coming next year as well. Yeah. Um, and Andor is also a long series. Is what is it? Is it is it ten or twelve episodes for the first season? I think it's twelve. Let me just double check that. Andor season one has yeah twelve episodes, and then season two they've now confirmed will be the final season, which is kind of original or, or not original, kind of um, interesting because originally. It seemed like we were getting four seasons and then yeah. three, uh, and then now they're down to two. It's cut, the w way the second season is being structured. They're kind of, um, from what I, what they've said, they're doing three episodes, a time jump, three episodes, and something different. Yeah, um, so that should be very interesting. Yeah, it seems like it was more a reorganization of the same set of story arcs rather than a real 
like, oh, we cut off a season. So uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. No yeah. Star Wars game news in the last week or so. Very unfortunate. I was really expecting that KOTOR sneak release uh, after the indefinite delay. That was just just to put us off balance. Bam, we get the KOTOR release. Yeah, but, just, uh, a, just, just a big fuck you to Jason Schreier. Yeah, it didn't happen. Uh, there was, I believe, a new character added to uh, Galaxy of Heroes, wasn't there? Uh, there's a couple. So they, they've they announced that Jabba is coming, which is fun. And he's like one of the galactic legends, so like one of the top six characters that require a huge grind for that I'm like two years away from. Uh, so he's coming, and then Ben Solo will be coming. Uh, he was announced, is probably what you're thinking of. Two okay, or three yeah, that, that's the one I was thinking of. And that's yeah. how that's how far we've got a scrape for Star Wars game news. Yeah, well, I, I so I talked about this on my YouTube Shorts channel, but obviously, I, as I'm sure you do, uh, do lots of research on on Star Wars to see kind of what's trending and you know if there's anything that I'm really missing out on, how the winds are blowing. And one thing that I was interested in is that Star Wars is having a big tie-in with um with like a league of legends mobile clone uh that's really popular and i think it's like southeast asia it's called uh bang bang mobile legends um huh. and like these were like the top viewed star wars videos the two promos clearly because they've been doing paid advertisement on them uh but yeah so big star wars tie in with that i, I think the characters the, the way they're doing it is probably a smart way where they've introduced four characters, but they're just skins of existing characters. Yeah. Um, so it's like, I think it's Yoda, Kenobi, uh, oh, Vader, and then a First Order Jet Trooper for some reason. Uh, so yeah, that's huge. I had no idea. I posted the short and apparently, you know, outside of uh, North America, but I, I think especially Southeast Asia, it's a pretty... yeah. I mean, I, I'm still holding out hope for a, an actual dedicated Star Wars MOBA, so yeah. that's that's still the dream. But yeah. anything else we want to get into before we talk about Balance Point? I don't think so. I'm trying to think if there was any real news. Oh, and I mean, we didn't talk about the Andor trailer itself. That was so... released while I was away, and oh. I think I have forgot about it, it when I got home. So, oh. yeah. You still haven't watched it? I don't think I have. Do it right now. No, I don't think I will. Pretty, pretty good trailer. <laughs> I mean, it's it's more or less more of the 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 first one. Like they they're keeping their their cards pretty pretty close, which is nice. But the big actually kinda... no, I think I did see it. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. Okay. I did. I did see it. The big sort of talking point has been they're not using the volume. Yeah, and people people are going way too far on like the criticism of the volume. I, Absolutely. And this has I, been annoying me for ever since the last trailer release for Andor. Yeah. Um, and Tony Gilroy said specifically that they don't use volume at all. Um, he said, we're old school. And this reminded me a lot of when episode seven came out, one of the, or, sorry, when episode seven was announced, one of the first things that JJ did was he had one of the little merchants on um, Jakku he had like an, he, it was a full animatronic. Uh, and he was like, we're going back to practical effects. And everyone was like, yeah, practical effects, sick. And I agree that the volume definitely has its weaknesses. And I think personally, like in the hands of a wrong, the wrong director, it can probably be a little distracting, but like, it's also an incredible tool. And so, it's such a new tool as well. Yeah, exactly. Like there's a lot of whole of a uh, toupee fallacy with, special effects were like oh you can always tell when it's cgi yeah. it's like no yeah. you can tell when you can tell it's cgi and there's a lot of confirmation bias that goes in that like you only notice the things you notice kind of yeah. yeah yeah totally uh like and i think the mandalorian season one is kind of an example where like most of that was done in the volume and there were very few complaints there were a couple of scenes that maybe um showed a bit of kind of iffiness but like when you're talking about the book of Boba Fett, in my opinion, that was a show that used the volume very, very well. Um, and like, I think one really good example of that was the orbital ring that he visits. Yeah. But that was probably full volume and it looked phenomenal. Um, 
So it's like, it's an amazing technology and it's the pushback against it's a little annoying. I do think that there is also like, I think there's watching the ILM documentary. I think there's like a bit of an undeniable magic to, you know, real stuff. But George Lucas, like one thing you get from that documentary is he says specifically, if he could take it out from his brain and put it on screen, he would just do it that way. And that's why he made the prequels how he made the prequels. They're pretty much entirely filmed in front of a green screen. So like, if you're one of those people that's like, oh, George wouldn't have done it this way. Like, are you fucking joking? George would have had six volumes set up and (laughs) he would have lived in them. Yeah, like, (laughs) ah. Movie in a week. (laughs) It's it's basically just, you gotta have the right tool for the right job rather than saying, oh, everything needs to be in the volume or practical effect. Like, if you rely too much on practical effects for a show, you're probably going to end up with a lot of environments that look the same. And that's probably going to be fine mm-hmm. for like Andor being in. We've seen that it's like, oh, this foresty environment, which is probably going to work fine for that location. But when you want something else, then it helps to be able to have a tool like the volume. Yeah, that's one thing that people are really I think that's a great point. And that's one thing that people are really kind of purposefully ignoring, I think. It's like the option isn't for every scene, the volume or fly out on set every time because like shows don't have unlimited budget. Neither do movies. Yeah. But I mean, shows are even more constrained. Yeah. Um, and like sometimes the practical sets haven't looked as good. Like uh, Tython, a lot of people complained about yeah. that not looking great. And in, uh, it looked fine as a set. It didn't look great as Tython. Mm-hmm. And now we're coming into Andor, which like, looks very similar to Tython and it's it's more acceptable because there's not these expectations built up around what that should be. Yeah. Yeah. So it like people are making this uh, like a false comparison where the option is like either you're going to film on like you're going to film in the volume or you're going to film on the surface of Mars and Mars is probably going to look cooler for a sci fi planet. But it's like don't work that way. Yeah, the the transit to Mars is just it's really underfunded. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so if we're gonna get it into Elon as well the whole time, yeah, he, he just then Shatner's gonna be there on the way for some reason. Arnold's always trying to get there. <laughs> no, he's just telling you you need to go there. <laughs> get you to Mars. When he was governor, there was that weird push for like film development where he was telling Hollywood that they'd only get grants if they. All went to Mars. Strange. That wasn't Arnold. That was Douglas Quaid. <laughs> so, balance point. Do you want to give your rating up front with this one? Oh, I should also I... say first, uh, I'm planning to do my Glup Shido next week because we should okay. have a shorter topic. We were doing the book this week and last week I was yeah, too yeah, lazy yeah. to. Uh, That's but... totally fine. Totally fine. Uh, and we've been busy too, because I, I noticed you're working hard on your shorts, and they seem to be picking up quite well. Yeah, I was gone for the weekend this weekend, which was mm-hmm. it made everything have to be bundled up more. So I, I so I was gone Saturday until Tuesday, uh, but I thought I was getting home Monday for some reason when I was making my schedule, because it was like, oh, I'm coming back the last day of the weekend or the day after the last day of the weekend, and since it was a long weekend, that meant it was actually Tuesday. But I was thinking. The equivalent of Monday, and mm-hmm. so that really fucked me up because I'm just apparently bad at calendars. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was nice. I I didn't want to like overdo it because I usually, whenever I go home to visit my family, I just fucking cram everything in for a week. So yeah. I decided to make the tough choice to like be okay with there being slightly less stuff coming out, and it was nice yeah. to to take that break. And it's good to do that now before uh, before September. <laughs> yeah. And things get crazy. Yeah. So, uh, Glup Shido next week. Series the the Glup Shido series will continue. But I think the most important thing to talk about with Balance Point is that we got another appearance of something. I know this is really important to you. We got the etheric rudder mentioned again. Hmm. We did. Yeah. That's a good point. I think there were a couple mentions even of it. Yeah. There was a, at least one. Uh, was was that when Jason was flying? But uh, but yeah. It, yeah. It's still creeping its way into the, the public consciousness. As as, every, as everyone knows, you're you're a big defender of the etheric rudder, big fan of it. Yeah. Do you want to explain what it is for anyone who's forgotten since X-Wing? 
Yeah, so the etheric rudder is something that is, is used most prominently in X-Wing, but I think may have been used as early as, as Heir to the Empire. I think Don maybe mentions it. Um, but the idea is that it's sort of hit, like they never explain what it's for, but usually you hear about the etheric rudder causing a ship to, a ship to like drift around or take a turn. And the, the kind of idea, and I think Pablo did a, a, a big post about this at one point, is that Star Wars could basically not exist. It, like the ships aren't in a vacuum, rather they're in an ether, some sort of right. like other... Um, it's jello, but very thin. Yeah. So, and that explains a bunch of things that some people affects their enjoyment, like why sound propagates through space, why ships um, seem to need, like, you know, in Star Wars, if you, if you, if your ship turns its engine off, it stops. When in the, you know, if you're in a vacuum mm -hmm. and you, you stop, your ship keeps going because there's nothing to resist it. In the, in the kind of ether theory, it's the ether which is kind of resisting, and that's why you know ships don't endlessly accelerate, and why they've got to kind of keep their engines on, and why they behave more like starfighters. Ultimately, it's a lore explanation for what was a you know stylistic choice that that George Lucas wanted to essentially make the ships look like World War II fighters. Yeah, and then you can just say a wizard did it, but they yeah, decided to go with this instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought there was there was some other mention of something that I I was trying to remember. I don't think I made a note of it, unfortunately. But uh, I don't know. It's it's not in here. We got we got a hymns call out, I believe. Yeah. So okay, that's something that's always uh, always kind of weird. Where a lot of the talk around Black Fleet Crisis ends up being that. Uh, all the other authors just ignored it forever afterwards. Mm -hmm. But in that, that's true of like the other pre NJO books where like Corellian trilogy, whatever, they were all written around the same time. So it's understandable why they wouldn't reference as much. But if you look at NJO, they may not bring up stuff like the Nebula Star Destroyers or anything, any of the ships. Fifth Fleet gets a lot of mentions. But in this yeah, one. like the characters, the Fifth Fleet as an organization or whatever. Black Fleet Crisis almost gets more play than any other set of books or individual books in njo throughout it at least so far and that includes even uh so far even the thrawn trilogy though that picks up more later with the smugglers alliance coming in well in x-wing yeah uh, i i think what you mean is like it gets more because there are a few things that are actually like directly incorporated whereas like obviously mara is from yeah you know, the thrawn trilogy but it gets you're right it gets a lot of like it's a lot of lip service. But for stuff to... So Mera is essentially already upgraded to main cast and like Jane yep. and Jason as well. But yep. when it comes to things that are getting name dropped, then uh, characters... Like if you're looking to pad out your story with side characters in NJO, then mm -hmm. BFC seems to be where you go to. Like a lot of the command staff gets mentioned a lot. A bot has been brought up a few times. Yep. Commodore Brand, I think, was also from uh, BFC originally. I might be wrong on that. But we also have okay. Joy Eicroth here, who is one of the professor or one of the researchers yep. in that. And she shows yep. up on this. Valindy Kalenda. Uh, Valindy Kalenda is, was Corellian Trilogy, I think. Or, wasn't she? Or, yeah, yeah. Isn't she the one that's. No, like, she was in both, I think. Was she? Okay. Was she? No, I might be. I, remember, I might be wrong. I think on she's that. only I think I'm right on trilogy because yeah. she's like the contact. When, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're that one aside. Uh, they were. <laughs> there was I caught in this. I think there was one other one as well. But they think they, they show up a lot more than I think people. Yeah, no, remember I, I, or give credit I definitely, for. I definitely agree with that. Um, and, and it is kind of nice that they do pull from. Like, like a Corellian trilogy is probably, in my opinion, the most forgettable of like the Bantam era full trilogies, mm -hmm. um, even more so than Black Fleet Crisis. Um, but, you know, we get it in a big way in this. We get Centerpoint Station. We get Evil Uncle Han. We get um, we get Belindy Kalenda. Uh, just lots of little details kind of touched on. I mean, last the last one was kind of a had lots of it even had the, the the side characters from that novel in there so yeah 
And we, we will get a lot more of Thraken as well going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's played a bit of a role so far as well. Uh, but he really comes in with uh, with Legacy of the Force too. So yes, the <laughs> two. Of, yeah. Okay. Well, we get in enough trouble for <laughs> my, this. My, Justin. I might actually cut that one out. I might actually cut that one out. Come I on, might, man. I might bleep it. Twenty one minutes. I'm going to write that down. Get <laughs> down. I'm. A, I actually am writing it down. I'm going to bleep it out. Okay, that's fine. So I guess I'll, I'll give a quick synopsis of what the actual book is about, since we haven't done that yet. But essentially, okay, yes, <laughs> sort of, but okay, this could, are you finished? One more, just do it. You know you want to fucking do it. Come on, just do it. I'm good. As soon as I start talking, you're good. Okay. <laughs> there it is. There it yeah, is. All right. So this book takes place on Duro, which is... Yeah, that, that is how most of the names of most of their cities sound. Thank you for demonstrating <laughs> yeah, that's that. that's true. Uh, like, I was, like, when the worm is destroying that one city where it's, like, Om, Om Orm, I was like, is that the name of the worm or is that the name of the city? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, the, this is where a lot of the stories start coming together from prior books, and by that I mean a lot of stuff gets recycled and we have to do the same thing. Uh, uh, so all the refugees, or a good chunk of refugees, have started settling on Duro, which has been uninhabited as a planet. The Duros live in <laughs> these orbital cities. Shithole. Yeah. Uh, most of the Duros live in an Anaheim. orbital city, which we've seen with the Ithorians already. Uh, so Leia is thinking, okay, we'll reform the planet so that people can actually live here. And Duro is also the, uh, the planet that the Vong are hoping to use as a jumping point to attack further into the core. It's kind of to the southeast, though, and they've come from the north. They kind of like done a reach around of the core very close and, to Corellia. yeah it's in the Corellian sector so there's a lot of political history there of not being happy with that uh, and the vong are like you know what we might take this we might not it it's fine just let us have it and you can your cities can leave so leia is handling all these refugee operations on the planet han is there as well they don't know each other or there <laughs> Leia's so within in charge. 20 kilometers, the galaxy's yeah. 100,000 light years wide, and they're 20 kilometers from each other. Yeah. Uh, so Han and the Rin, who have been traveling together in the last few books, uh, they're in one little domed city uh, where they're trying to do the reclamation efforts. He's in charge of that, but Leia's in charge of like the whole thing. Uh, so they all come together from that. Jaina gets injured in a battle. She gets sent there for recovery, but no one can find Leia. It was Evie. She gets evacuated, and Jason I do that at least once or twice a day. <laughs> That's healthy. Uh, That's when I was sick the other day. Oh man, your doctor would be proud. Oh, the, the Taylor stands got you right. Minutes. Yeah, awful. Talk about it later. Uh, I do have a, a tweet planned that I guess I'll, I'll run by you now. It's not that funny, but if we workshop it, it'll become less funny. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, basically, I want to do the exact same thing. We're Taylor Swift has her jets and everything, and everyone's dunking on her. So I want to do that with Luke and his X-Wing. <laughs> that would be funny. Luke Skywalker's X-Wing went on 500 private flights in the last year. I, I think he lives in it, honestly. <laughs> He's got a house on Coruscant. He smells weird every time. He's got a house and a fortress of solitude on Coruscant. And this weird droid is always on? That can't be good <laughs> for the environment. Not memory wiped it. Oh, you know, b before we continue, can I just can I retread a little bit? OK, because the intro, the introduction of this book actually does something really nice. It provides a very nice, uh, succinct summary of the war up to this point. You notice that right before the prologue section, you might have even skipped it. Uh, I think. It's so good. I read it like I'm, two I weeks may ago. So. Just, I may even just read it out right now for everyone listening along who's not reading or, you know, has forgot things. Did I do that? It, yeah, it's like, go for it. Oh, maybe take two minutes. Okay. <clears throat> they appeared without warning from beyond the edge okay. of space, a warrior race called the Yuzhan Vong, armed with surprise, treachery, and a bizarre organic technology that proved too much, that proved a match too often, more than a match for the New Republic and its allies. Uh, even the Jedi under the leadership of Luke Skywalker found themselves thrown on the defensive, deprived of their greatest strength, for somehow the Vong seemed to be utterly devoid of the Force. 
the first strike caught the New Republic unaware as it struggled to deal with the rebellion sown by Yu Zhan Vong spy No Manor and his agents. The New Republic force thus occupied the alien fleet, launched their first assault, which destroyed several worlds and killed countless beings, including Chewbacca. During a brave attempt to contact and make peace with the Vong, Elgos Othlo was murdered by Yu Zhan Vong commander Shadow Shai, who delivered the body to his close friend, Horn Horn. Horn then challenged Shai to a duel, the prize being the planet Ithor. Horn bested Shai, but the Vong destroyed Ithor nonetheless. The governments, uh, the New Republic government unraveled a little more with each setback. Soon the Jedi, chafing under what some perceived as Luke's excessive caution, um, saw a renegade group formed under the leadership of Kip Durin, who advocated using every available resource to defeat the Vong, including unbridled aggression, which would lead only to the dark side. The philosophical dispute, dispute drove a wedge between the Solo brothers, Jason and Anakin, while Sister Jaina focused instead on her new role as a pilot with the elite rogue squadron. Consumed with guilt for failing to save Chewbacca, Han turned away from his family, seeking uh, expiation uh, expiation in action, and foiled a Yuzhan Vong plot to eliminate the Jedi. Aunt Han returned with what seemed to be an antidote to the debilitating illness Mara Jade Skywalker endured. Leia too was beset with guilt. By disregarding a vision of the future, Leia feared she had condemned the Hapen fleet to ruin at Fondor, where the fleet was destroyed by the destructive power of Centerpoint Station, a weapon armed by her younger son, Anakin. Now as the Vong tighten their noose and press inward towards Coruscant in victory, Luke, Mara, Han, and Leia and their children, as well as the New Republic itself, must find the balance they have lost before there is nothing left to lose. I can't believe I just let you record a whole Eckhart Slatter video on the podcast. <laughs> yep. Trim that down, make it short. There you go. A little slower, make it a full video. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I, thought that was, I thought that was a good summary. Welcome to another lore video, where today the Yuzhan Vong are slowly making their way towards Coruscant. Yuzhan Vong were what some would describe as not very cash money. There you go. Uh, so Han and Leia, they're on Duro. Uh, Star-crossed lovers divided by mm -hmm. uh, Capulets and Montagues. But then on... You know, so we covered... and the other one from... Uh... Sims, it's the Goths and the other family. Oh, fuck. Anyway. Yeah, the, there's a bunch of lore behind that. It's but, a, uh, similar to Montague, yeah. Are, so are we going to do like a next week, are we going to do a Sims lore video or podcast? That could be fun. It could be done. But Jason's with Han. Anakin is with Luke and Mara. Uh, they're on Coruscant. And they're, they're sent to Duro so they can investigate Trini Vi, who is disappeared, Christina Lobe, future Jedi Council member's apprentice, uh, which means all of our main characters are going to be on one planet. So I don't think this has really happened in uh, in the series so far, where, sure, they start on, like, Coruscant and Duro, but everyone everyone gets to Duro together by the, by the end of it. Rather than splitting yeah. apart more, we're starting to get them more together. There's not much space left for them to be together in the New Republic, so mm -hmm. it makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, so we spend the first two thirds of the book kind of covering the reclamation efforts and uh, Luke and Mara find out that they're actually pregnant because of all of the fucking they have been doing throughout this series, which does not stop there. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wrote a note that was like they were fucking just for fun, <laughs> <laughs> which is rare for Star Wars. Yeah, but they did they or did they not have sex in what seems to be just like the inset of a doorway where they were yeah, hiding? Yeah, Anakin was right there. Yeah. Yeah. It, okay, that's a, that was a little bit weird. Like, I'm not... Yeah, not like, great. As we Between kind of covered at the Anakin start. Anakin ogling his aunt, not a great yeah. moment. Not okay. a great book for him. <laughs> so that was very Team Fucking Rocket for me, where uh, Mera was going in disguise. Uh, they So they get to, to Duro as... They're, they're dressed as Kubas, I think it was. Because uh, they figured that wouldn't stand out. It'd like It'd stand out a little bit, but not like they wouldn't Sorry, be dressed so as locals. <laughs> right in an apology to the Kubas community. <laughs> Don't just say it again. No, that time I actually said I'm sorry. That was Google Translate. Oh, uh, okay. They, that covers talk. Kubas now? Oh, excuse, excuse me. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they figured... You can also just put your hand under your armpit. And sometimes you get little Kubas out there. That's weird. I don't think that's how that works. But yeah, so they, they don't want to dress as Duro because then the Duro would realize, hey, those Duro are fucking weird. 
but they figured we'll be Kubas because then the Juros won't realize that we're in fucking plastic leathery suits. Uh, They're dressed as giant foreskins, which makes this entire story just a little funnier. <laughs> but then Mara's like, you know what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go as a Kuati person. And this disguise basically means wearing like a, a low cut dress and dyeing her hair slightly, then adding some yeah. putty to her, her nose and doing her makeup a bit different. And this is like apparently enough that Luke is like, oh, I don't know. And then Leia doesn't recognize her immediately. Like it. This doesn't seem this seems like enough to fool people who don't know her. But Leia and Bera are quite close, I'd say. And it's basically like coming in wearing the like the plastic glasses with the fake nose and the mustache on yeah. it. Like it's that tier disguise. And I don't understand how this fooled anyone. Anyone yeah. that she knew. You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, carry yourself a little differently. You know, Mara is, you know, she's not usually walking around like, you know, with the the Kawadi nobility with her little slave. So maybe that was, I don't know. Yeah, but she didn't have a Telbin. She didn't even really have a hair bun. That well, was... she does for a bit when she gets, when she yeah, gets when, Jane. Yeah, when Jane is there, but that's not how she meets Leia. Like, if your wife walked out wearing a slightly different dress and had her makeup done slightly differently, would you freak out and say, who are you no, and I, what have you I done? I wouldn't even notice the difference. There you go. I'm a bad husband. <laughs> uh, talk, about it talk about it later. We'll, we'll talk about that during Phasmophobia tonight. I've got to oh, sleep in the VR things, house. Sorry. <laughs> about, uh... About uh, Luke and Mara, their dialogue was really bad in this one. Um, yeah. Like, and there was one point where uh, where Luke turned into like kind of like a furry like self insert. Like, I just imagined a furry writing this when Luke having like a tail and ears. Like, if I get protective, please don't take it personally. Ooh. Better not, Mara growled. <laughs> <laughs> There was like, some, that was the other thing that I was going to say. There was some sardonic smiles dropped in this. Mm, yeah. And yeah, people saying was. point. Like, that is the most Zan thing that happens where people are in the middle of a conversation. You go read a page and there's like three people saying point after someone says something. So I'm, I'm glad All that Tim got uh, put in that way. Oh, what does he call the underworld again? The, uh, fuck. The taint? <laughs> the galaxy's taint? No, he called, he's got a, wow. Well, he's got a word for it. Oh, the fringe? Is it the fringe? I can't remember. Sounds right. He uses that word like a million. Uh, but yeah, I, I did. So I went kind of back and forth on the how the characters were portrayed in this. Some of the dialogue is a bit weird and some of like interpersonal relationships are kind of weird. I do generally like how Jason's struggle is framed and how Jaina's stuff was framed. Even if there were like some edge cases and how characters were dealing with each other that felt a little bit out there. Uh, and like as much as I liked the whole idea that Jaina was struggling with how Han and Leia were shitty parents, Mara's response was just no, and Jaina was like, "Oh, you're right, no," and it didn't really feel like hey, anything no, was totally really were. resolved there. Uh, and then with Luke and Jason, Luke is basically telling Jason the only way that anything good can happen is if you're acting with like absolute faith. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's like. You don't, it doesn't seem like the highest virtue in the world is to never think you could possibly have been wrong on the actions you were taking. Like, I don't know. I, I, I can't no, you're totally right. co sign on, on the message Luke was giving there. No, I agree. Um, it was just, I don't know. I just, I found Jason frustrating, like a lot of people do in this book. Han was like, not even, he was just like, he could have been anyone. Uh, yeah. Luke was really cringy with Mara the whole time. I just, I, there was not a lot I liked in this book. It was a real slog for me to yeah. get through. And the writing was just like chaotic in a way, like discordant almost, I found, mm -hmm. um, where it's like nothing is happening, but like it's almost hard to follow. Uh, I was like, what the, wait, why is Vicky Shesh here now? <laughs> she was, anyway, it was, I don't know. I didn't like it. Um, one thing I thought was funny, though, that I did like is at the very beginning when uh, Jaina is reflecting on the loss of Chewbacca and she says, I doubt it. a loss will ever equal this. Like, oh, boy. 
We're like four books away from Star by Star now. I think. Yep. <laughs> There's uh, what Edge of Victory? No. Enemy lines? I think it's enemy lines. No, it's yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. Edge of Victory, and then it's uh, and then it's Star by Star. So it's mm. two relatively short books, which I was uh, for. Whenever I think about the series, I always think about uh, Tahiri having a bigger role up to now than she does, because it's everything that's with her and Anakin just goes over the next three books. Yeah, no, I she gets kind of just introduced. I'm pretty sure when he goes back to the temple on Yavin, she's there. And then they kind of spend like a yeah. night canoodling and then he just dies. Yeah, because I thought like the, the stuff they do with Corin, where they end up in a locker... I thought that was more spread out from the Yavin stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, that's, I guess, where we're going. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so with Jason, his thing in this book is that he doesn't want to use the Force because he's afraid of doing the wrong thing. He has this vision of uh, what's going to happen. Hence the balance point. Yeah. I, like the, I like the vision, by the way. Like yeah. the, it's like Luke standing on the galaxy, and he's like in the core, and the Vong, are, and other enemies are coming. and It's, it's a cool image, and... You're right, Jason's scared to kind of tip it either one way or the other. Yeah, this this vision is going to be a big factor uh, for Jason up until the end of the war, because uh, it's basically, it is just the fight with Shimra and Onemi at the end that he's kind of seeing, and... Uh, we had a little almost, uh, 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 like, end fight moment in, the, in this book where he fully embraces the force. He doesn't go fully, like... Yeah uh fucking dr manhattan or anything but yeah he's kind of like shit on by jaina for a good chunk of the book for not doing anything useful which fair enough uh, but also like luke is not helpful in any of this no one really tries to talk to him very much about his problems and yeah. what luke does say is the thing about like you need to every act that doesn't come out of absolute faith can lead to the dark lead to fear and darkness rather than saying no, it's good that you have doubts because that might mean you consider what you're doing more carefully and that'll make it harder for you to fall to the dark side because you are thinking about this stuff. Because like that's the the problem I have with Anakin and Jason at the start where it's like it's like Anakin is good in that he is actively trying to help people whereas Jason does have a point in how they need to be more careful with how they use their power or else they're going to end up like Palpatine or they're going to end up like how Jason does ultimately anyways. And the way that Luke describes it here just doesn't seem like a very good position for him to take. As shitty as mm -hmm. Jason is, like this is not something that I'd imagine would would help resolve those issues. It's it's the same thing that Mara does with Jaina and her issues with with Leia, where we we get to a point in this book where Leia or where Jaina forgives Leia and kind of goes back and rescues her. Uh, when Leia is knocked out and she has this like grudging respect for what Leia yep. does, but it's almost treated as if Mara's conversation with Jaina was the start of this turning point and Jaina coming back to respect mm -hmm. Leia and like forgiving the fact that no, they actually were bad parents. Yeah, you're totally right. And like, that's kind of the weakness of the book. It's like all of these conversations are happening on the fly. It's like when Luke has his conversation with Jason, he like is literally walking into the room for a second. He has a five minute conversation and then leaves because the book puts so much useless shit. Like the whole thing about there being two different colonies. It's kind of an interesting idea, but so much time is just spent on nonsense ultimately. Uh, and like mm. the, and that means that these conversations, which are interesting because the 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 Han and Leia, like you mentioned, being bad parents thing is something that they would talk about. It's something they do talk about in Legacy of the Force and 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 more in New Jedi Order, I think. And it's something that fans talk about a lot as well. Yeah. So it's like that is something that you probably should focus on instead of it being, oh, we gotta hunt down the obvious uh infiltrators within this organization is that's gonna be gone by the end of this book. It's just like so much of the plot feels totally disposable. And like when you're reading it, it's like, listen, I know, I know generally like there's going to be Yuzhan Vong collaborators in the Duros government and this organization and they're fucking people over. Like, you know, from basically page 10, that's what's going to happen. So you got like 50 pages where you're reading through that throughout the book. It's just like, yeah, it feels disposable. Like I, I've generally liked the, like the refugee storyline and yeah, me too. Uh, the problem I've had with it in this is that it, 
the essentially the evacuation of the planet is the entire plot ultimately of the of the book and it's something that we've done i think twice already so like i i'm fine with that still being a background thing i'm good with it still happening it's just when there's so little else that goes on around it and when like the the interpersonal drama that's supposed to come from it feels like it's a little bit slapdash then it does take away from it a bit for me uh and like look at how jason gets off of the the city station the city ship thing where he's yeah. just handed a shuttle by the Senesi. And yeah. the justification for this is that the Senesi, uh, like the Senesi religion, the Senesi preacher gives him the shuttle. Like that isn't the, the explanation isn't really an explanation. Like, sure. It's a preacher type. Sure. They have this, uh, strong belief in an afterlife because they go through a metamorphosis where if Turned they survive, the butterflies. yeah, like the, that none of that really explained why that specific preacher felt the need to give Jason that ship at that point. It was just like a convenient thing that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of frustrating because that could have been like, if that it was an interesting idea and Jason even kind of remarks like, Oh, the force is really trying to tell me that I'm on the wrong track here. And then it's just gone. Um, whereas like that would have been kind of, that could have been, it's weird, but they could have done something interesting with it, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. There, there were a lot of Sunesi in this book. Yeah. Weird, too. Yeah, there were a few uh, aliens that I don't see brought up. There was one one of the Cantina aliens, I forget the name of, with the big kind of big head. Not the Sunesi, another big-headed alien. Um Yeah, but it, I, I'm always, always glad to see, uh, always glad to see aliens brought back. So, Baikonot is bringing up in chat uh, the idea that, uh, from what I was saying earlier on Jason's unsurety and what Luke is telling him, uh, that it discounts the whole quasi-religious element of being guided by the Force. When you feel guided by the Force, you need to act on it and not hesitate. And... I think that's true when the direction you're getting is like in the moment from the force. And Jason does that. Uh, he mm -hmm. does that a few times, even before then. The problem is when he's. They're talking not just about directions from the force, but also what his role is going to be. And that's been what Jason's larger questions have been about. In this book, it gets a bit more towards, should I use the Force at all, yes or no? And no is the wrong answer there. So as far as Luke is trying to address that, I think he's correct. But as far as how Jason is going to end up deciding what his proper role on a broader sense is, I don't think it's a particularly useful thing to say, uh, considering what Jason's issues are. But, yeah. Yeah, um... Yeah, it's like I don't I I, I don't know. Like I I understand I, I it's you know, part of being a Jedi is you do have to give yourself over to the instincts. Like that's whole, you know, Yoda's thing, no one to listen and when it's time to listen, listen. Um so, you know, having some moral dilemma over whether you want to open your ears at all is certainly worth having, especially where he's not sure, you know, the fate of the galaxy. Um it's just it's not handled in the best way, I think. Yeah, like I, I think it, it's more helpful and a better message to have to say that instead of he needs to go from shutting himself off entirely from the force to just being sure, like always making sure he's the most sure about everything. Yeah. To just say like, no, your doubts at the start of this were reasonable and it's good that you are thinking through these things and that like you can do that while still acting in accordance with what the force wants at you, mm -hmm. but also don't fucking shut your shit off and allow other people to die in ways that you could have easily prevented because you're being a little piece of shit sometimes. Like, yep. There's, there's ways to, to not do that. Jason, go fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also the species that I was thinking of, it was the Vuvrian. Have you ever seen them before? The Vuvrian? Vuvrian. Yeah. What do they look like? Just I can't even explain it. Oh yeah, these guys. I could never tell if they were meant to be insectoid or furry. 
I think they were honestly like they're like the ultimate example of like we got a leftover like failed fucking alien head. <laughs> Stick it in the streets of Moss Eisley somewhere. <laughs> Apparently it's who Luke sells his speeder to a Vuvrian or Vuvrian, whatever in episode four. I didn't notice he actually got the money for that. I don't know. That was a well. He talks to Kenobi about it. So. Yeah. yeah. I think it's just like I think it's happening. I, th I think the scene probably focused on on Obi Wan or something. But yeah. So, what did you think about the Savong Law Jason duel situation? Because I I was actually looking forward to this book more in the lead up to it, where like the the duel between Jason and Savang Law was something that stood out as a much bigger moment for me. And it's something that like stands out as one of the main things I remember of the early half of the Yuuzhan Vong War. Uh, mm -hmm. But getting to it here, like I, I finished reading it and I even went back and reread it because I thought like, oh, did I miss a few pages? Because it felt a lot less substantial than what it's I remember. It's like he hits him with a piano. <laughs> well, it's like a, a desk, right? He has desk, yeah. And knocks him out the window. I, th I think the bigger thing like that I kind of remembered is like the fact that Leia is being tortured essentially mm -hmm. and is, is very injured. But yeah, compared to like the corn horn duel, um, like it's not very memorable. It, it, it's clearly just like a setup for, you know, Savong Law to be the big, one of the big baddies throughout the war. The problem is he doesn't really look very badass in his first fight. Other than the fact that he does have, uh, rather than having kind of the normal, uh, Von Dune crab armor or whatever. He's got the armor kind of implanted into his skeleton. So yeah, doesn't have the same kind of weaknesses. But other than that, like he's not, doesn't seem particularly like ferocious. He like chides and makes fun of Jason, but like Jason yeah. fucking crushes like him and his cadre of warriors. So it, it could have been better for sure. I didn't think it was funny that it was kind of undermined by, and I, I don't think this was intentional because this is the first real appearance of him but he tells jason oh you're not worthy go fuck yourselves i'm not gonna kill you uh but then after jason basically fucks him up and runs away his leg is pretty much mashed potatoes from the desk hitting him and yeah. he's like oh, i'd uh he would petition the priest for a crafted enhancement he lost that for the result of an honor duel. He didn't think the priest would refuse. Like that wasn't an honor duel. You didn't think you wanted to fight the dude, and then he kicked your ass. You don't get yeah. to to make these demands. Savang Law is like the most fucking sus individual in the whole, other than Vicky Shesh. Because like the whole thing, the book ends with him reaching out to the Republic, and being like, "Hey, it's chill. I just want to live with you guys." Like, just give me the Jedi. When like he literally just lied to everybody on um on duro the vong melted ithor after their honor duel they haven't once ever held up their end of the bargain yeah. and yet it's still gonna be a fucking thing and that's something that i find a little bit annoying where like the vong haven't once shown any willingness to you know they don't think that the the people they're fighting are on the same level as they are they think they're an abomination and need to be destroyed so it's like the fact that the galaxy would, is going to believe and there's going to be you know fracturing about how to handle some of the jedi is is a little frustrating but also you can kind of justify it by saying there's people are so scared that like yeah they'll they'll latch on to anything yeah i think that i think there's a large element of that being intentional where it's yeah like everyone thinks that okay it'll stop before it gets to me like first way, they that's came even for Vicky, that's even vicky shesh yeah well, she even she, does the same thing where it's like, oh, Rand is a betraying yeah. little shitwad. I'm fine. I'm betraying, yeah. but I'm better than that. And I'm doing it for Kuwad yeah. and herself. She, and, she wants she wants station. Yeah. Like there, there's kind of the uh, the comparison between Vicky Shesh and the leader of Cor Corduro, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. who are doing fundamentally the same thing. It's just Vicky is doing it in a more, uh, slightly more nefarious way. Uh, Whereas the Duros kind of come around at the end, even though his sister is still a piece of shit. Uh, what else is there to say on on balance point for now? Eh, there's a space oh. battle. It's not really much of a battle, though. Um, yeah, there's not really much that gets covered on the battle. The only thing that's sick is Anakin shooting a torpedo down the fucking worm's head, but... 
We have two Scarl and uh, Scroat, whatever uh, the fucking name is. Yeah. Scroll yeah, and two Scart. That's I think that's it. Two monsters, basically, right? Yeah. The the worm and the hammer worm. Yeah. Uh, but I think fucking parasites. If you ask people who's the uh, who's the war master of the Yuzon Vong, they're all gonna say Savong Law. Maybe you'll get some sulking laws in there. But I, th- I think Nash Choka gets gets slept on a bit. I think he's a much better character, a much more interesting character uh, when he comes around. So we'll, yeah, we'll have to do a Nash ranking Choka's of the War Masters on the end. Not a War Master, but I think Nomenor is easily the most interesting. Yeah. Um, just because, like, what are the problem with the the Vong? Well, actually, I'm not. I don't. I don't want to overstate things because. One thing that we've seen is that they all see themselves as righteous adherents to like the Vong ideology, uh, but they all they all cop out in their own ways. Um, yeah, I think that's that is one of the interesting things that the series does is that they start off as this like almost evil monolith, and then yeah. the further you go in, the more that gets kind of stripped down into the individual ways all of them either go along with or subvert the system that they're in. Yeah. Like they don't actually want to do pain or they don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. Like you get this, you start getting the shamed ones over the next couple books. I think next, Mm -hmm. I think the next book or two have quite a bit of that because that's where Anakin has to get involved with that other warrior. You see how the warriors have like their own uh, takes on the religion afterwards. Uh, And then by the end of it, you have like, even at the higher levels, you have, uh, High Priest Jakan, you have Nash Choka, Animi, and Naminor as kind of like the big leaders alongside Shimra that all do also have their own positions on everything. Mm-hmm. And even Nash Choka as mm-hmm. like the leader of the military is able to uh, to work more with the New Republic because he's the one that kind of signs the armistice with them. And mm-hmm. yeah, but that's that's the end of the war. So that's just something I want to keep a little bit more of an eye on as well. Yeah. Because it, it's also, like, for me, I'm not going to lie, a lot of the Vong will end up meshing together. So I, I'm like, I'm trying to be, like, extra, you know, this is this is X, this is Y, this is how they're different. Um, yeah, I, I think so far that that's fair. Where, like, they, they haven't really been different characters. They've been different names attached to the same set of personality traits mm-hmm. in every situation so far, except for Nominor. Yep. But uh, with that said, do you want to give a ranking? For this here book i think i'm going to try to pull up our ranking sheet right now yeah sure this one for me is a d i think yeah i think this is a d i really really didn't i'm trying to think of things that i liked about this book and what are some positives uh even though it is a bit clumsy like the the characters i think are sometimes a, a benefit yeah, it's just like it starts off from a premise that I find really annoying them being 20 kilometers away, literally 20 kilometers away on the same planet, which itself is just one other refugee world. Um, and of course, everyone's going out of their way not to notice each other. Leia hasn't bothered checking on the kids. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's just so that it starts from a bad premise. The plot itself is very uninteresting, in my opinion, like the actual yeah. plot. The Vong are going so, to invade this refugee world. Uh, the only thing I kind of liked is, and I meant to mention this, some of the kind of world building is cool. Like, like the Vong talk about how they're trying to keep planets between them and Corellia mm-hmm. um, because they're not sure about Center Point Station until Vicky Shush kind of blues them in. Uh, I like that. So that's like what brings it up a bit, but I just really didn't like this one. So it's going to be a D for me. going to be a D. Uh, let's see. That's four, I think. No, that's two. The D for you. Uh, and for me, I think I'm going to give it a C. So I'm a little bit higher on it than you. Not super much higher, but... Do you remember what we gave Brotherhood... I think we both gave it a B, didn't we? Probably, yeah. I'll I'm have to sure go back and check on that. Sounds about right. Uh, but I think it it'd be a, a good time to just see what we've rated all the oh yeah NJO books so far. So we opened up with Vector Prime and both gave that a B. Uh, then. 
for Dark Tide. I gave that a B as well, and you gave that an A. Uh, mm-hmm. Dark Tide. Yeah, I really like that one. Dark Tide Ruin. Uh, we both gave that C. Okay. Agent of Chaos. Heroes Trial. We both gave that C. Then Agents of Chaos, Jedi Eclipse, both gave that B. Uh, and Balance Point, you've now given that D. Wow, what the fuck? I hate to use on Bong now. So you've, <laughs> you had the highest and lowest individual ranking. I've only had three or fours. You've had a five and a two in there. Or, a, mm-hmm. sorry, uh, you've had an A and a D, whereas I've only had Cs and Bs. Uh, and Star by Star will be your S. And I, I'm curious where that's going to land for me, if that will be... I haven't read it in ages, so... I don't, I don't know, know that Star by S, Star is going to be an S. I thought it was your favorite. I It was the one that I remembered the most going in, and I was thinking it would be, okay. but then I... Trader's going to be an S. For sure. But, I don't know. Star by Star might be an A. We'll have to see what goes on there. Fair enough. I think, like, overall, we're going to start having most of the ratings climb up a bit from here for the war. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, I also don't have a vision of the future ranking for either of us. I forget what we did with that. Oh, vision of the future, was... lesser evil, and brotherhood are the ones we're not sure of right now. Vision of the future may have been an S for me. Sure. Yeah, it was a, like A, a we'll or check. S, but yeah. yeah. One of my favorites, so. All right. Uh, that does it for those. We have a few questions as no well. No new reviews, by the way, guys. Come on. Oh, that's... How how dare you? Absolutely disgusting. All right. So we have a few questions here. There are still some game questions that I have... uh, that I have start off for when we have our next game episode. Uh, If you've sent a Yuzon Vong-related question, uh, these are going to be all the ones we've had so far. So if you don't hear it here and there's something you still want to have the answer to, even if it's for an, a prior book, just send it back in. Uh, our organizational skills for this is uh, not fantastic, and it's entirely my fault. It's not Justin's fault. I handle this part of it. So blame me. Anytime there's a poor, poorly edited audio uh, experience, that's usually me. All right. So like last time I didn't put an intro in. Oops. How fucking dare you? Our first question this week comes from Garrett, who says, do you have a favorite and or least favorite retcon for Star Wars Legends or even Star Wars in general? What would you say have been some of the most controversial? I personally find the concept and history of retroactive continuity in fiction to be fascinating. Do you want to give your favorite, least favorite, then I'll give mine, and then we'll talk about controversial ones? Uh, Yeah. I don't like the inhibitor chip very much, but it's not my least favorite. I, kind of broadly, I don't like when they do too much of a small universe thing, mm-hmm. um, but it works out in some cases. Like I do like Mara being at Jabba's palace and on Endor. Um, I think of things I don't like. I like the ship retcons that end up happening, where you know, um, Fractal Sponge will reach into the dark empire or into yeah. like an old marvel cartoon or sorry marvel comic and, and make a ship out of it the Vergier one really sticks out as being yeah. uh pretty bad other stuff i like um you go and i'll, I'll see if i can think of any more because that's a really interesting question the Vergier one is the one that i was going to talk about as being my least favorite uh, i actually did a short on it today uh that i haven't published yet but I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to title that. Uh, something about Palpatine's secret Sith apprentice. But No, it's got to be like why fans hated this Sith or something. Uh, but yeah, that's the one that I think is the most importantly not great to me. Because I yeah. So I've said before that Jason's storyline overall is my favorite character storyline, like in broad strokes. But I don't include Vergier having actually been a Sith retroactively in that. Uh, yeah, me neither. I like I, I accept that it happened or whatever, but I don't think it's necessary for Jason's storyline. I think it even works better if Lumaya was just fucking with Jason with that. Because uh, I think like the progress of Jason's story still makes sense going where it does, even if that wasn't what Vergier was trying to say, because you can... You can read some of what she says that way, but having it just be overtly 
that I feel takes away a bit from what she was doing and how Traitor worked. Because, uh, yeah, basically the idea is Vergier, who we've seen in one of the books so far, uh, or some of the books so far in NJO, is gets retconned by future stuff into having been a Sith who had trained a bit. It's not going to make sense. We don't even know that she was a Jedi at this point. Yeah. But, but yeah, so it, it's kind of messy. I don't, I don't love the inhibitor clip chip thing. Um, trying to think. The, the Revan one is another one that I don't really love and which I think most fans also oh, don't really yeah. love. That I Revan. Like Sith Emperor thing. Yeah, that Revan was just kind of made into Valkorian's little. Yeah, Sith I mean, because we know we saw something kind of out in the unknown regions, and that's a very interesting premise. But like, I the idea of taking away agency from characters by making them puppets is, I think, never. Yeah, like, like the idea that he saw something that he was trying to like almost prepare the galaxy to fight against, or trying to take control to fight against, then and then even lost himself, maybe. Yeah, um, I like uh. A lot of like the Star Wars, I like the uh, Waru, uh, they, I forget, it was the article that connected Waru and the Anti-Force to like lots of the other kind of interdimensional stuff that existed kind of on the the kind of outskirts of the EU, mm-hmm. um, like the Charon from the, um, the other space uh, source books. I think that's really fun. I, I like those retcons. It's like stuff that nobody ever cares about that only appears in source books, but then um you know someone will come and and uh kind of connect it all i i like that the retcon that leia and luke were siblings rather than the new character that was going to be introduced in what was going to be episode nine uh made the whole kiss really awkward so good job on that george but uh but yeah i think that's a, a question that we could probably discuss in a bit more depth in the future when we've been able to like for it a bit more like that could be an interesting topic for some kind of expanded discussion but thank you yeah. um abel pena i think it's how you say his name he does a lot of i was trying to remember he does a lot of uh like the the retconning stuff mm-hmm. he would, he did a lot on like the starwars.com um so i i like a lot of what he does yeah I, it's for it's for nerds I will say that like a lot of fans get their backs up a little bit about the idea that there are retcons at all. And that's not especially useful position to take, I don't think. Because when you're dealing with a universe, the scale and scope of Star Wars, where there's so many authors that are trying to bring their own flavor or style to their own books, I think it's inevitable that you're going to get these contradictions or clashes in what's going on. And ultimately, it's usually like source books or something else that are trying to tie these things together for the people who really give a fuck about that element of it. So there's always going to be something that either needs to be retconned or will get retconned. Uh, so I, I'm, I think one, it's an interesting yeah. thing that happens. I don't think it's a bad thing that happens. One missed retcon that they should have done that didn't do is I think they should have had the Zeist and Fleet be the Star Destroyers that kind of disappeared from the galaxy like like that's part of the reason why the empire broke up so quickly because palpatine was siphoning ships away yeah uh before the war even because like the twenty five thousand star destroyers it's it's hard to you know kind of wrap your head around that i think that would have been really interesting especially where imperial one star destroyers disappear after episode four and Um, then they just get put under a magnifying glass yeah it's like the fact that they made the Zeist in larger. I mean, it, they probably wanted to be film accurate, but I just find that really frustrating because that could have been a cool retcon that I think actually would have worked really. Yeah. I mean, just don't have them blow up planets. I fucking... The Zeist in, have one that blows up planets. Just have the fucking eclipse. You almost did. Just do that instead. Yeah, because you don't need to blow up a planet. I, like, it's... I, everyone loves that scene in Kodor where they just bomb the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So thank you, Garrett. Next question Great comes question. from Joel, uh, who says, bring up a point you brought up last New Jedi Order review. Do you think ultimately it was a mistake to not kill off Luke by the time of NJO ending? And oh, not really. 
Well, I, I kind of stand by what I said, and I think our, our discussion with Ilkin, where it was, if you really need to kill off one of the characters, I think ultimately Luke probably would have been the right choice, that you can still have that clash between Jason and Anakin. I don't think it would have been the best for, like, the appeal of the books, because if Luke's not there, then who gives a fuck for a lot of people? But if I'm just thinking purely Star Wars is going to be fine no matter what, what's the most interesting narrative thing you could do for me personally, then I think that. But I do think that for like yeah. keeping people interested, if you kill Luke, then it's uh, difficult for the books to to get as far. And yeah, then it, I just it was don't think people, many, would, but... people wouldn't accept Luke Skywalker dying in a book. He's like, you know, the, one of the greatest heroes. And like, I, I just I just don't think people would have accepted it. Um, and from that Point, it's hard for me to say that it would have been a good idea i just I, I think fans would have been there would have been so much pushback against it yeah and i, I, I don't think, think you can kill luke in a book one thing yeah like one thing you can say about the the sequel trilogy is that killing luke in a movie where there's other characters introduced as well there's enough of a broad uh knowledge about who ray is and who finn is and who poe is that even without luke Han and leia you have these other younger characters that you can work with for the next however many years of Star Wars in universe. Whereas if you are someone who has only seen the movies trying to get into the books, uh, if you are starting with like a legacy of the force or fate of the Jedi or <clears throat> whatever, where Luke is dead and Han and Leia yeah. are gone or Han and Leia would still be there, but where Luke is gone, then I think that's a harder sell to get people in on. I agree. Uh, thank you, Joel. Next question comes from Felicia, who asks, I've been slowly catching up to you guys. I'm on the Corellian Trilogy, and I was wondering when you're going to start to cover the Junior Jedi Knights. You finished Young Jedi Knights and have started NJO. Just got to get some Anakin in before he's gone. Also, who'd win in Star Wars trivia, Corey or Justin? My money's on Corey. Corey would now definitely fight over win. It or something. I think yeah. if it's movie stuff, you would, like, fucking demolish me. I don't know. I've got a really bad memory. If it's, like... Like, I can't remember names, and you're really good at names. Like, if it's, like, what happened, I can, you know, describe it really well. Um, but if it's, like, you know, what docking bay were they in? Or, like, what like what was the name of the actor who played... The actress who originally played Mon Mothma? I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't know that either. Like, movies are a huge blind spot for me, and that's part of why I've been doing, like, production videos for clips, because just an opportunity to kind of learn about stuff that I never really bothered with. Cause like yeah. movies are, I like the movies, but I was always more into the books. And so I have a lot of background knowledge stuff from working on Thrawn's revenge and a bit of a yeah. broader, like post Endor knowledge base for that. And especially like RPG source book related stuff. But when it comes to movies, I think I just, I don't know quite as much. Sure. Uh, I just have a memory where I really struggle with, with names in particular, like I've got a good memory for describing how something works. I think that was is why I was a good lawyer because I could always, I, I could I could always formulate an argument really well and then look up you know I could yeah. remember exactly what the what the case said just not the actual words. Right. Um. And I think that's why I'm really bad at trivia. <laughs> um. And the, what was the what was the other part of that? So junior Jedi knights and oh yeah. So I was thinking we could fit potentially some of them in uh in the middle episodes leading up to star by star or we could leave ourselves with some anakin in the future for middle episodes i'm not sure what makes the most sense because we could yeah. go like really heavily on anakin for the next six weeks and then we never talk about him again or we could go medium heavy on anakin for now and then get back to him later i think we should keep doing um the the uh, tales. tales of the jedi comic and then maybe once we're done that we still have to do Jedi Prince because we yeah, started we have that. To I'd like that. to finish that. Um, so maybe after we're maybe done with after those. Jedi Prince. Yeah. Or actually, maybe we should do Jedi Prince, then another comic series, and then Junior Jedi Knights is the next like sure. interspersed thing. And then we're gonna have TV shows and stuff. So it's yeah. it is coming, but I don't think it's it's particularly. Yeah. Soon. We don't want to entirely drop the Anakin just yet. Because Tahiri's gonna be back in a big way by yeah. the time we get to like. like uh thank you felicia the next question or the last question for the day comes from peter 
who says, After finishing Survivor's Quest recently, I listened to your episode on it where you had a long discussion about species having traits like greed or servitude and feeling that those should be innate, universal qualities. I get where you're coming got from. got some of that in this book. Yeah. I get where you're coming from on this, but part of what makes sci-fi and fantasy interesting is the ability to create species that have innate psychologies that humans don't. I feel like too often people who do deep dive analysis on stories want to make everything an analogy for something in the real world or insist that non-humans only ever think or be treated exactly the same as humans, wanting their alien nature to be literally only skin deep. As a writer myself, it's fun and interesting to explore what a society would be like if built around such a species. It's also important to remember that a lot of writers work out the specifics of those systems for themselves, but including in the story would be too clunky and unnatural. Also in Vision of the Future, you do see at least one Bothan who isn't greedy, self-serving, or backstabbing in any way. The officer who responds to the break in at uh, Cliff and Navit's shop. So I think we did uh, we did say that there were some of that breaking away from it in Vision of the Future, but that it does still kind of get into the mold. It's less that there shouldn't be these alien psychologies and that they shouldn't function on different like value systems or function in different ways from humans. It's more that usually the way it ends up is that it's not that they're different from humans. It's that they end up being one personality type that could be entirely fit within a single human as well. So they're not outside the scope of humans. They're just within a very narrow band of humanity. And they're usually done to represent a specific yeah. group. And that's where the biggest problems come in. Right. And, it, and that, that's, exact, that's kind of exactly what I was going to say. Like, I think when Star Trek, the original Star Trek, I think, does this well, where there's they have aliens who have these interesting cultures and it's more than just like this is the cowardly alien or like we talk about orcs i i, th I think because we and we discussed harry potter i think when we brought this up last time where it's like okay have a species that has an interesting backstory and okay give them psychological nuance they don't have to be humans but having it be like like this is the cowardly this is the conniving species i just don't think it's very interesting and it is I'm not going to I'm not necessarily going to say it's problematic, but it can, you know, it, it can be where lots of stories in the past would be like, this is what black people are like. This is what Asian people are like. Um, and and, you know, th this is obviously not the same thing, but, yeah, you know, you can see how it, it like, let's be honest, Star Wars has had a lot of issue where, you know, the Nemoidians, Watto, like, the Gungans, George Lucas, you know, has been accused of of essentially creating racialized aliens. Um, and that's probably worth a discussion. Yeah. Like, I think having the idea of this is actually something we talked about a bit today with the Vong, where like the idea that the species is <laughs> built different than yeah. humans and has this other generalized way of working, uh is fine as long as like when you examine that more there's a bit more nuance to it rather than just the uh, Vong are a great example because we would never say the Vong are you know falling into the same trap i don't think that like well, say the bothans do yeah like the the bothans i think are aren't even really among the worst examples of it no 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 uh, because they have there are so many counter examples like a seer where you kind of learn about what the Bothan society is like, the reasons it's like that, and how these other individuals fit within it. But when it's played entirely straight as like, these are the, uh, yeah. the this type the of people, goblins. they're all exactly like that, and yeah. any attempt at breaking away from it is just stupid and should never really happen. And Randa almost falls into that a few times, where it's like, he keeps doing the same stuff that is like mm -hmm. the, almost a caricature of a hut. And it, it just gets old kind of quickly. Yeah, and right. and it, that's that's a, there's like another issue there that we've talked about many times on the show, where it's like a character is defined by their first appearance. We get that in this, where it's like mm -hmm. they specifically say we get a Bith Jedi, I believe, and it's like Bith are known for being musicians. It's like, yeah, why couldn't these just be Bith musicians? Or it's like uh, all Twi'leks or many Twi'leks are dancers. All huts are gangsters. Most Rodi most Rodians are are criminals. It's like that takes away a bit from the what's great about Star Wars. If you watch A New Hope, there are so many aliens. I talked about Tatooine. I talk, like that one alien that I hadn't even really noticed. There's so many of them, and you really get the feeling when you go into the cantina that this is a gangster who is Rodian, you know, and yeah. 
they kind of not not even from a you know social justice stance or anything like that that's not even what i'm talking about it's worse for the universe makes the universe less interesting when every rhodian's a greedo when every twi'leks and ula when every hut's a java yeah like, i definitely i understand where you're coming from with a lot of this peter and I, I think we do largely agree on a lot of it just like trying to make sure that by having the aliens be different it doesn't end up as being the aliens are just such a narrow slice of what could be done by a human so i definitely agree that you don't want aliens to just be reskinned humans you can have like the culture the way they think impact them as characters but i do think they need to be able to be characters as well in their own right uh, yeah. And that that's largely where I think we were coming from with uh, with our discussion in in that element and with a lot of this stuff with the Yuzon Bong as well. The, the uh, oh, fuck, not the given the um, yeah, the insects, uh, the Vors. The, no, the um, one that worked on the Rogue Squadron ship. of Rotix. Yeah, like they're fun. Like they're nothing like humans, and they're you know calculating, and they like have the weird kind of like math. And yeah, I think they're done and interesting. Vratex yeah. and there's different Vratex and yeah. Yeah. And I think like the inter- one of the interesting things with the Bothans is how like after they get developed a bit more, a lot of the uh monolithic nature of them and how they're perceived does end up being more of this is the perception and this is how it's kind of forced on other Bothans. And like I think a seer is a pretty interesting character because of that. I think Borsk ends up being a pretty interesting character after he's developed because of that. Uh, and I think, but I think like, I think Borsk is actually a really good example of this because there is a middle point where he doesn't get examined as a character at all because it's just, that's the Bothan for you. He's shit. But when you get further towards the end and even a bit towards the start where it's Borsk is like that because Borsk is like that, even if there's elements of this is the way that Bothan society and culture works there is a bit more nuance to how he's handled. And it's really just that nuance that I was yeah, looking for a bit more. And I think part of this is the fact that like a lot of these books, like the Bantamera books too, different authors coming in short period of time. You need character templates. You know, yeah. Go with what people understand. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you all for the questions, the emails, any ratings you want to give us uh, on iTunes or whatever other platform you listen on. Uh, if you uh if you want me to read your uh your rating in the next uh in the next episode for one just leave it and I'll probably read it but if you really want me to somehow compare us to some sort of creature in Star Wars so should we be doing the next chronological arc of Tales of the Jedi next week yeah i think so unless something else comes up so how do we want to really? do this then cuz there's the there's the two issue one and then there's like a seven issue one with it so you want to do all nine or What are we thinking? I don't know. What do you think? I it's it's not it's never that long for the comics. I think we can probably do we can probably just put them both together. We definitely can. We can do it. Yeah, no, I'm fine with that. It just might mean we don't have quite as much time for other stuff. Uh, But yeah, we'll 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 go with that. We'll say that and we should be able to get through all of it. You know the names of them? Uh, I don't I think. Something dark side of the Sith Lord or something. Uh, <laughs> saga, uh, Tales of the Jedi. Let's see what it's called. Just so that we don't end up being afraid that one of us is going to read the wrong one for next week again. Because I keep thinking. Which I want, yeah. Yeah. Every time I'm like, okay, did I, did, did I fuck up? So there's the Freed and Nat Uprising. Yeah, there's Freed and Nat Uprising and Dark Lords of the Sith. So we'll be doing both of those together, I think. Which sounds okay. sounds like it fits. All right, so we are going to be playing some Phasmophobia in... We're going to be starting off in virtual reality. Uh, then Ek is probably going to quickly drop out it of that. made me sick as fuck last night. To throw up. Yeah. But that'll be over on twitch.tv slash Corey Loses, as well as youtube.com slash E-C-K-S-T-O-O. Uh, we're going to be joined by Charlie for that, and it should be fun. Have some drinks, hunt some ghosts. Good times.